Welcome to this uh, Michigan Region 8 uh, training session uh, for EMS agency users who will be using the Michigan EMS data system, which is Image Trend Elite. Uh, today we'll be covering how to uh, enter patient care reports in the system and how to manage and access those reports. Here's our uh, agenda for today. We'll take a few minutes with some background information just to get you familiar with uh, the system and what's changing and, and uh, things like that. But we'll spend the bulk of the time today just filling out a patient care report and uh, taking a look at tips and tricks and things to be aware of uh, how, to, how to fill out a report. And we'll just wrap it up with a little bit of uh, uh, support information. All right, so we're gonna start with this picture here. Uh, that illustrates who uses the information from your patient care reports. Uh, of course, you as an EMS are the um, cornerstone of this picture. You're the ones that go on the calls, uh, treat the patients, make a difference in their life, and you write a report of the stuff that you did on the call. Uh, and then you send that report into the system, and uh, oftentimes the rest of this can kind of look like a, a black box, uh, and you're not sure really where your information goes. So this uh, picture is to help illustrate the different uh, pieces that are involved. Um, one uh, way that the information in, in the system is used is by medical control authorities. Medical control authorities are currently receiving access to the Michigan uh, Image Trend Elite system so that they can uh, view patient care reports for uh, everything that's happened within their MCA. And so that's currently being worked on right now. Some MCAs have access. There's still a few who don't have access yet. Uh, but they can use that to uh, really get a good understanding of what's happening throughout the MCA. The state EMS office and other uh, areas of public health in Michigan also use the information from uh, your patient reports. Um, they use it to make uh, public health or policy decisions at the state level. Uh, they want to really understand how EMS is working throughout the state, um, not just in Lansing or Kalamazoo or Detroit, but everywhere, uh, and uh, put policies and, and things in place that uh, make for a good, healthy, strong EMS system throughout the state. Uh, your data is also available to researchers. They can request data from the state. They have to go through an approval process for that. They only receive the data that's necessary for the particular project they're doing, and they, um, uh, and they must keep the data confidential and protected. Um, some of the data from the Michigan system will be sent to the national EMS database. Researchers can get data from that national database as well. Uh, the data in the national database is de-identified, so it's not possible to identify um, a particular patient, for example. Uh, but we can get general statistical info uh, from each of the calls that you've gone on. Federal and state governments can use the data from the national database. I've also drawn an arrow all the way back around to uh, your agency. And that's because uh, your agency, as an administrator or anyone in your agency, even the public, can access the national EMS database at nemsys.org. And you can access uh, dashboards and other publicly available reports um, to uh, get a, a view of what uh, EMS looks like across the country. Well, hopefully then, as an agency, you'll also use the, the data directly from the Michigan system that you put into the system uh, and get it back out and uh, use it to understand what's happening within your own agency. You might identify training needs or uh, staffing or, or equipment or vehicle needs. Uh, finally, I've drawn a, a slightly grayed out arrow to hospital personnel. Uh, the plan is for hospital personnel to have access to the system to retrieve reports electronically uh, that you have put in. Uh, that connection is not in place yet, uh, but that is something that the state is planning on doing. Once that connection is there, then hospital users uh, will be able to log in, and in one place, they'll see all patient care reports delivered for patients delivered to their hospital. So that's a picture of how the information from your patient care reports uh, gets used. We'll uh, move on to um, a little bit of history here. 
Uh, we use the NEMSIS data standard, the National EMS Information System. That standard, uh, the first widely adopted version of that standard was published in 2004. It was NEMSIS version 2. And it gained really wide adoption across the entire US. Michigan went live with their NEMSIS 2 system in 2008. And if you've been using the Michigan Image Trend State Bridge system, then that's the system you've been using. It's their NEMSIS version 2 system. Well, NEMSIS version 3 has come out. It came out in 2011. And all of the states, all the agencies, everyone across the country are working on making the switch from NEMSIS 2 to NEMSIS 3. Um, for Michigan State System, uh, Michigan has continued to contract with ImageTrend, the company, to provide a new product called ImageTrend Elite that implements Nemesis version 3. And then other software vendors are all upgrading their systems, their products, to support Nemesis 3. Uh, Michigan went live with collecting Nemesis 3 data in 2016 and uh, set um, the cutoff for NEMSIS 2 data uh, at the end of this year. I want to just briefly explain the NEMSIS data standard, the National EMS Information stand, uh, System. This is a data standard that defines a whole bunch of data elements that can describe things that happen on an EMS call. Uh, it has 428 data elements for a patient care report. 130 of those elements have been labeled as national elements. Those are the ones that get collected by everybody across the country and are sent to the national database. Outside of that, each state has determined some additional elements to collect statewide. Michigan has done that and uh, has added about 100 elements to the list to come up with a total of 233 elements that are either national or Michigan elements. Outside of that, each agency could decide to turn on some additional uh, data elements to collect within the agency. Uh, that still leaves a couple hundred data elements that are defined in the standard uh, but not turned on. Uh, for example, uh, there are four different data elements that collect odometer reading call. Uh, your starting odometer, at scene, at destination, and back at home location four different data elements for odometer readings. Uh, odometer readings are not required at the national or state level, so they're not on the form. But if your agency needs to collect odometer readings, for example, you may need them for billing purposes, then you're able to add those uh, data elements to your agency form and uh, collect those. Another question that comes up is, wow, 233 data elements, are, are we answering that many you know, filling out 233 boxes on every single patient care report? Uh, the answer is no, uh, because the system adapts to the type of call that you're reporting. Uh, here's a couple examples. If uh, there was a cardiac arrest, then there are about 19 data elements that ask questions about the uh, cardiac arrest and the resuscitation efforts. If there was no cardiac arrest, which is most of your calls, then uh, all 19 of those data elements are hidden on the patient care report form. They just go away. Uh, same thing for trauma. If there was traumatic injury, then there are about a dozen data elements that ask about injury details. If there was no injury, those elements are hidden on the form. Uh, as an extreme example, if you had a canceled call, uh, then the system will hide a whole bunch of data elements uh, because there are just a handful of elements that that would need to be filled out for a canceled call. So the system will adapt uh, depending on the type of call that you're recording and just present the data elements that are uh, pertinent to that call. Uh, there is never a, a one particular patient care report where all 233 data elements would apply to that report. All right, so that's the NEMSIS data standard. It uh, allows for that consistency across the nation um, uh, along with the local flexibility to collect what you need to. All right, so what's changing, what's not as we make this move? Uh, the standard is changing from NEMSIS 2 to 3, and that's why the software is changing. As we move, uh, as we move from a, NEMS, a NEMSIS 2 system provided by ImageTrend to ImageTrend Elite, which is their NEMSIS 3 system, um, and that will be supported by the state of Michigan. 
Uh, also, just as a heads up, there may be changes in timeliness requirements. Currently, your reports are due by the 15th day of the month after the call. So if you had a call in November, uh, then that report is supposed to be submitted to the state system by December 15th. The state is uh, intending on tightening up that time frame requirement. I can tell you that uh, in, you know, quote unquote, in real life, uh, in the NEMSIS 3 system, uh, the average lag from incident to uh, report being created is only a few hours right now. So most reports are coming in just uh, shortly after the call has finished. Uh, other state requirements about you know, what kinds of calls you report, stuff like that, uh, are not changing. Um, so in your agency, uh, be sure that uh, you talk with uh, everyone else in your agency about how you'll do this change. Um, if you're going to make any changes to your workflow or process within your agency, this is a good opportunity, a good time to consider those changes. And you want to make sure that you uh, communicate well within the agency to explain any changes that you might be considering as you uh, move to Image Trend Elite. All right, so to uh, kind of summarize what I've shared so far, you know, people ask, well, why are we moving to a new data standard, new system? We have to do training. We have to get all up and running on something new. Why not just stick with the old one? There are some benefits for making this change. Uh, first is standardization. NEMSIS version 3 does a better job of covering what really happens in EMS. Uh, NEMSIS 2 had some limitations. Uh, one was primary impression. Uh, on about 50% of EMS calls in the old standard, uh, people would look through the list of primary impressions. There was nothing on the list that actually matched the, the impression that they had on the call. Uh, in NEMSIS 3, that's improved. And there's a much longer list of impressions to choose from. Uh, this should lead to better documentation. Uh, we will also have better documentation because of better data validation. Uh, NEMSIS 3 includes some data validation stuff that's built into the standard itself, so all products are implementing it. Uh, and this particular feature is that validation rules can be set at the national level and implemented at the data entry level when you're filling out reports. And rules can be set by the state that are implemented and shown to a user at the time they're filling out the patient care report. So we're seeing, but we're seeing much better quality of patient care reports. They're much more accurate. Uh, Image Trend Elite is accessible from any device that has an internet connection and a web browser. Uh, it's not limited to Windows or Internet Explorer, or any of that. Uh, so that, um, that kind of frees up some more options for you for reporting. Uh, the move to NEMSIS 3 also uh, brings along better potential for information exchange with hospitals. That's because NEMSIS version 3 is better aligned with the data standards that hospitals are already using in their systems. So it makes it a lot easier to connect between the two. Um, this, this should hopefully lead to improved management and training within your agency. You'll have a better picture of what's happening uh, out in the field. And of course, the bottom line is we want to improve patient care. And uh, that's what we're all driving for. OK, we're going to switch gears here and uh, get some practice with patient care reports. First, I want to uh, briefly explain the uh, reporting process. I've uh, indicated some key points along an EMS call down along the bottom here. Uh, at some point, you know, your call starts when you get dispatched. And you start responding to that call. You do a bunch of stuff, and eventually the call is finished. I've indicated some key steps in the patient care report process on the top here. Uh, sometime after you've started responding to the call, you'll start your patient care report. Now, depending on your agency, it may be after you've finished the call that you start your patient care report, and that's fine. Um, sometime after the call is done and you're done filling out your report, um, eventually you're done with that patient care report, and you'll mark it finished. This is a key step in Image Trend Elite, uh, kind of a gateway, um, because it checks to make sure that uh, if there are any critical validation errors, that you take care of those before you can mark it as finished. So that's a key step that we will look at today, marking a report finished. 
Uh, once Michigan gets the process in place, then after you mark the PCR finished, it'll get sent off to the national EMS database. Now you can still review the report uh, after it's been marked finished and you can make changes to it. Uh, eventually you're all done with those changes and you may send it off to billing if your agency bills. Okay, so let's jump in. I'm going to use a training user account today to demonstrate uh, and uh, that's something that you could use as well for practice. Uh, if you have your own Image Trend Elite accounts, then you can use that for practice too and, and just delete reports when you're done with them. Uh, but with this test account, it's kind of nice. You can just practice and leave the reports in there. You don't need to worry about deleting them because they're in a test agency. All right, so the quickest way to get to the Michigan Image Trend Elite system is this URL I've provided here, myemsys.org with a hyphen between my and emsys slash elite, myemsys.org slash elite. The user ID that I'm going to use today is testmedic. The password gets changed uh, every so often. You can contact the Michigan EMS office and they'll let you know, uh, that would be Kevin Putman, he'll let you know what the current password is for that account. Here's the login page at myemsys.org slash elite. If it asks for an organization ID, it's Michigan. And then that'll take you to this page asking for username and password. This is a good page to bookmark uh, if you want to come back to later so it'll remember the organization ID already. I'm going to go ahead and put in the user ID and password for this test medic. I'll agree to the data privacy statement. And I'm logged into this test agency. Uh, the way we fill out patient care reports is by going to the incidents menu in Image Trend Elite. And there's a section that says create new EMS. Uh, agency administrators can uh, manage different data entry forms that can be used for patient care reports. The Michigan EMS run form is the one that is deployed statewide for all agencies. There's also a non-transport run form and that one's handy for agencies that never transport. Uh, if you don't see that run form in your agency, you can go to the tools menu um, if you're logged in as an administrator and you'll have something called form manager. Uh, in the form manager page, then uh, it'll show you all active forms, but if you clear the active filter, then it'll show you inactive forms as well. And you'll find an inactive form called the Michigan MFR BLS non-transport run form. And then you could go ahead and activate that form for your non-transport agency. If your agency transports, then the Michigan EMS run form is a good one to use, at least initially. And then you may get some ideas about how you want to make tweaks to your data entry form. And in that case, you would need to make a copy of this form through the form manager. And then you can modify your copy. Okay, so we're going to start a patient care report with the Michigan EMS run form. All right, so this is the patient care report form. Uh, let me point out some uh, things about the layout here. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a series of sections, and within each section is a series of panels. We're currently in the Incident Info section, the Incident Numbers panel, and then in the middle, we can see the actual data elements that we're going to be filling out for this patient care report. Uh, then we can click Next, and it would take us on to the Dispatch Info panel, or we can click directly on any of these panels or down to another section in the report. There's also a handy uh, box up here in the top left to find a field. Uh, if there's something you're trying to enter into your report but you can't remember where it goes, then uh, you can use this box here. For example, if I type MCA, it'll tell me that the responsible MCA data element is in the Incident Info section in the Incident Info panel. So it'll be this panel down here. If I click on it, it'll take me straight to that uh, data element so I can fill it out. Okay, let's jump in and get some practice. Uh, you'll notice here it's asking for an incident number and a response number. 
And there's some kind of a validation message here. If I click on the exclamation point with the red behind it, I'll get a little message telling me what's wrong. In this case, it says either incident number or EMS response number is required. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and make up an incident number for today. You'll notice that as I leave that data element field, the error goes away. And uh, it said I had to provide either an incident number or a response number. I can provide both if I want, but only one. Uh, once one is provided, that satisfies the error message. Patient care report number is auto-generated by the system. OK, so we're going to go through the pages of this report. I'm not going to visit every single data element. Uh, there are some pages that we will breeze through very quickly. I'm going to try to focus on how you interact with the system, the different types of data elements that you'll run into and how to uh, use them. I'll also focus on some tips and tricks that uh, may speed up your data entry process as well. OK, so let's uh, move to the dispatch info. Complaint reported by dispatch is a selection list. Uh, I can scroll through the list here, or I can start typing, um, and it will uh, give me everything that um, fits uh, what I'm typing. We would go ahead and choose a dispatch priority, whether or not emergency medical dispatch was performed, uh, et cetera. OK, and on the incident info page, there's a key data element here, which is the incident slash patient disposition. Uh, most of the time, you're going to have it as treated and transported by this EMS unit, if you're a transporting agency, or treated and transferred care to another EMS unit if you're a non-transporting agency. And then there are lots of other choices as well. Um, I'm going to pick treated and transported by this EMS unit. And you'll see there's lots of stuff you know, further on that we're going to fill out on this report uh, because I treated and transported. Uh, let me show you what happens, though, if I choose uh, canceled prior to arrival at scene. I'm going to choose that. And you can watch over here on the left-hand side, the uh, menu items are going to change quite a bit. OK, so it shrunk down a lot. And lots of red stuff went away, too. Um, since we were canceled prior to arrival, there's only a few things that we would need to fill out about the incident. But we wouldn't have any meds, procedures, vital signs, et cetera. So that's the key element there that drives a lot of the logic and validation in the report. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to transported by this EMS unit. Uh, I'm going to say possible injury was yes. If we say no here, it's going to hide the trauma page. I'll also say yes to cardiac arrest. If we said no, then it would hide the cardiac arrest stuff. Responsible MCA is a good example of a data element that uh, you may want to set up a default value for uh, in your agency. So, because um, you know most of your calls are all in the same uh, MCA. So go ahead and pick one. Let's move on to uh, the unit info. You'll choose the vehicle that responded to the call and the unit call sign. There's uh, a configuration setting in your agency settings where you can connect these two so that as soon as you cho uh, choose a vehicle, it will go ahead and choose the call sign that has been assigned to that vehicle. Also, if you've set up your vehicles with a, a default value for primary role and level of care, then it will autofill these two data elements as well when you pick your vehicle. Uh, if not, then I'll need to go ahead and, and fill these out myself. And we'll say we were the first unit on scene. Okay, so we'll move on to response info. Uh, this is just stuff you would continue uh, working your way through uh, to fill out uh, the information about your call. Let's take a look at type of response delay. <clears throat> so this would describe uh, any delays that you had getting to the scene. And this is a multi-selection list. What happens is you can click as many as you need to off of this list. So if you didn't have any delays, you can say none slash no delay. And that's what's on there. Uh, but you, if you had multiple kinds of delays, you just pick the ones um, that apply. You can just keep clicking on each one. 
it's keeping a, a running list of everything you clicked on. And when I click out of this box, you'll see it's kept that running list there of everything. Now, since I did have delays, I'll go ahead and click the X next to none to get rid of that one. So that's how you record these multiple value list elements. Let's move on to the incident address. You'd go ahead and put in uh, whatever uh, you'd have for your incident address. You can type in your zip code and then set your uh, city from the zip code, uh, or you can do a lookup for the location. And if you do that, it'll fill in zip code, city, county, state, all of that stuff gets filled in, and country. Okay, let's look at the next one, which is crew members. This is where you'll add your crew members who were on the call. Uh, click the Add button to add one crew member. Uh, it, it may auto-select their level for you. If it does not, then you can contact Kevin Putman at the state, and he can set things up so that that'll happen for everyone in your agency. And then you can indicate what um, roles this uh, person had on the call. That's one crew member. To add a second crew member, you go back up to the Add button at the top. and add their roles. So now I've got two crew members in here. If I need to add a third, I can just hit the Add button again and keep going. Let's go on to your times. Uh, this page can be a little bit tedious. This is where you put in all of your response times. Um, you'll see that some have been highlighted based on the type of disposition that you had chosen. So we indicated that we treated and transported, so we expect some things to be filled out here. Uh, the two times that you'll absolutely have on every single call will be your unit notified by dispatch date time and your unit back in service date and time. The others will kind of depend on the type of disposition, the type of call that you had. Over on the left-hand side, the left column is the date, and then the right-hand column is the time, the hours, minutes, and seconds. Uh, one shortcut I can use is if I um, fill in the time, just typing in those numbers and then leave that box, it'll autofill today's date in there. Uh, of course, if it was a different date, then you'll have to um, switch that date. Um, there is also, when you put your uh, cursor in here, you'll see uh, there's a button over here that says current, so that'll put in the current date and time. Uh, and you can use these buttons here to adjust the date or the time uh, that's pretty handy on tablet computers, um, but otherwise you can use just numbers on your keyboard as well. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a few uh, dates here. Uh, let's see. Okay, like that. All right, as we move on, uh, some additional info about the scene, how many patients, whether or not it was a mass casualty, and any delays that we had on scene. Okay, so uh, moving on to patient info. Uh, there is a button here to find a repeat patient. This is a feature that you have to turn on in your agency if you want to use it. Uh, so if you have patients that you kind of see on a regular basis, then that can be a handy feature to turn on in your agency general settings. Uh, if you use that feature, then you'll need to put in a first and last name, date of birth. Uh, those are the three that uh, uh, at least that you need to have. You can put in other fields as well, and it'll show you a list of uh, past uh, calls for patients. And then you could choose one of those patients. And uh, what'll happen is it'll fill in all their demographics, um, based on past information. It'll also fill out their medical history. And uh, so that'll save a little bit of time on the call. Um, anyway, otherwise, uh, we can go ahead and put in their name.
a date of birth. It'll autofill their age and some additional info that we could put in here. Moving on to the patient address. If you responded to the patient's home, then you can go ahead and click the button that says same as incident address. and It'll fill all that stuff in. Uh, otherwise, you just go ahead and type in their address. Uh, you can enter an alternate address for the patient. That's not required. That's optional stuff. And you can also put in closest relative or guardian, which is also not required. That's optional. Uh, finally, you can indicate the patient's employer, and that is also optional. OK, moving on to patient history. This is where you put in their medical or surgical history. Uh, one thing to point out here is that uh, this is a very long list of very detailed ICD-10 uh, diagnosis codes. The state needs to do some cleanup on this list. So it is a little bit hard to use right now. If you can't find what you're looking for on the list, for example, if you look for cancer, um, oh, there's a few things showing up now. So they have made some improvements. Uh, but if there's something you can't find, you may need to turn to your narrative to indicate things there. OK. Let's move on to uh, the next one, which is patient allergies. If they had any uh, environmental allergies or medication allergies, you can indicate those here. If they didn't have any medication allergies, you'll notice there's a red thing here saying that you need to fill that out. Uh, there are some data elements where you'll find this button with a minus next to it. And that allows you to record something called pertinent negatives or not values. So that's where we can pick no known drug allergy for medication allergies. And then that satisfies the validation error. Next, patient medications. Any medications the patient is currently taking. This list also is extremely detailed, uh, contains lots of stuff that should probably be uh, cleaned up and, and turned off. But uh, if you do try to search, you should be able to find um, something. And of course, like I say, you'll find tons and tons of other things too. And you can just record as many as you need to of the patient's current medications. All right, so we're going to move on to activities. This is the section of the report where you record really the, the, the bulk of the stuff that you did as an EMS responder. Uh, assessments or physical exams, vital signs, medications, procedures, and a few other things. Let's take a look at assessments. This is where you'll report everything from the physical exam that you did. Uh, you can um, pick, for example, a skin assessment. Uh, you can say that it was normal. Um, you can say that the head assessment, you know, there was controlled bleeding and there was also a burn or whatever. You can click as many as you need to. and It'll keep that running list like we've seen with other elements. This is one way to fill out a physical exam. There's a second way to do it, and it's this blue button over here that says assessment. This just gives a different layout to fill out the same information. So you can choose whichever layout you prefer. One advantage to this layout is that it has a button that says all normals. If I click that, it'll, it'll say, I did a full body exam where everything was normal. And then I can just go to the area that was not normal and can um, pick the uh, issues that they were having there. And so now I've recorded a full exam with everything normal except the head having some issues. And then I can click OK to record that. So both exams show up on this running list here. I can use either method. Same thing goes for vital signs, medications, and procedures. So here's one way to enter vital signs. And I would work my way through um, entering uh, some, some numbers as I go. Uh, and make my way through the vital signs. The second way to do vital signs is over here, the blue button that says vital. Just a different layout to enter the same kind of information. And away we'd go through that um, form. So use whichever layout you prefer. They both uh, will do the same thing. 
Okay, medications works a lot the same way. Uh, we can indicate when we did it, uh, whether it was done prior to our unit, uh, who did the medication. Um, medication given, this list will depend on who did the medication. So if I say that the MFR, someone who is an MFR did the medication, then I get a, a shorter list of medications to pick from because those are the meds that MFRs can do. I'll just say oxygen. Uh, and on through the list. Okay, you can also do medications using the blue button over here, just a different layout for the same kind of information. Procedures work the same way. The list of procedures will be uh, determined by the level of the person that you chose that did it. And then you can choose whatever procedure it was, make your way through the rest of the elements here to fill out the procedure. Or use the blue prox button over here to uh, report a procedure using this layout instead. Okay, so that's where the bulk of your activity gets recorded on the call. We're going to move on to complaint info. And we want to look at primary and secondary impression here. This is one that I mentioned was a very short list in Nemesis 2 and is much longer now in Nemesis 3. So you should be able to find uh, what you're looking for on this list. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that there was an injury to the ankle. Um, I want to point out yet another way to browse these selection lists. So what I've shown you so far is you click on the drop down, you either scroll through the list or you start typing to filter it. There's a third way here. You can click this little button that looks like a list and it brings up a categorized view of the list over here. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that you can drill down through a category. So for example, I can go to the injury category and see all of the different choices for injuries and then pick what I want to on the list. So just another way to, to utilize those lists. Uh, after my primary impression, I could uh, go ahead and, and uh, record any additional impressions that I had. OK. Uh, next is the patient complaints. Uh, there's a few things to fill out here, but I want to focus on complaints right here in the middle. Click Add to add a chief complaint. So you'd say chief. And then you can type in whatever the patient said. And you can indicate the duration of that complaint. The way you would do that is you would put in a number here and then pick the time units here. So I've now said 15 minutes. I can click OK and that has added that one complaint. Now if I need to add additional patient complaints, I can click Add again. I can say Complaint Type Other and can fill out another uh, complaint there. Then you can also indicate the anatomic location and organ system of the complaint. There we go. Next is symptoms. So you've recorded your primary impression, which is this is what we think is the problem on this call, uh, you know, why we had to respond. Uh, symptoms record everything you saw as you um, uh, were, um, you know, as you respond to that, that patient. All of these symptoms led you to have that impression that you had. Uh, so anyway, you would go ahead and fill out uh, whatever um, uh, stuff that you needed to here with your primary symptom and any other symptoms. Okay, so we're going to breeze through some of the rest of these. Protocols is where you'll add any protocols that you used on the call. Um, oops. Like we used a trauma protocol or whatever it might have been. Injury information. This page is showing up because we said possible injury was yes. Um, 
if we did if we said no, then this entire panel will go away. Um, we would indicate, uh, you know, um, what caused the injury, the mechanism, uh, and some other things uh, such as vehicular injury indicators if it was a traffic crash. And I guess I did say or we were dispatched as a traffic crash, so maybe I should choose that. Uh, some additional information about the accident, if it was a traffic crash. This is the cardiac arrest page. This is hidden if there was no cardiac arrest, but it shows up if there was an arrest. And we would work our way through answering the questions on this page for cardiac arrest. The next page is labs. That's optional information. So we don't need to worry about that if you don't do labs. And we get to our narrative. I can just type in my notes about the call there. Uh, there is also the uh, opportunity to use narrative templates if you'd like to do that. It'll kind of pre-fill a, a, a template in here, and then you kind of fill out the rest from there. So, for example, if I use soap, it kind of fills in some stuff, and then I go from there. At the agency, you can administer and you can manage uh, which templates are provided, if any. Okay, so we'll move on to transport and destination info. How many patients did we transport? Uh, was it emergent or not? Uh, did we use lights and sirens or not, et cetera? And some uh, you know, additional things about uh, what we did, how we transported the patient, how we got them to and from the ambulance, and all of that. Destination info is uh, the place we took the patient to. So, um, Let's, uh, let's get down to transferred to. Um, so if we went to a hospital, we'd uh, go ahead and pick that, and it's going to fill out the type of destination. And as we move on to destination address, it'll fill out the address as well. Okay, if you're a non-transporting EMS agency, then what matters here is that you pick the agency that you handed the patient to. So that should be on the list as well um, right here. Uh, so you'd be able to just pick um, the EMS agency that you handed the patient off to. If you transport, you go ahead and pick the hospital or other facility that you transported to. As we move on to destination address, that has been filled out for us if we picked a facility. Uh, otherwise, if you maybe you know transported to some random location to do a handoff to someone else, then you might have to type in the address. Okay, we're almost to the end of the report here. Um, there's nothing in supplemental questions unless you add something in your agency. There's a little bit of billing info. These are the two elements that are required at the national level, primary method of payment and CMS service level. Uh, the other stuff, um, like a physician certification statement, that's optional. Insurance plans, that's optional. Only use it if you need it in your agency. Signatures are also optional, uh, but if you need signatures in your agency, then uh, you can go ahead and add that. Uh, for example, I could add a patient signature, click the button to get their name filled in, um, indicate that they signed it, and then the patient can go ahead and uh, put in their, their signature here, which, uh, of course, works a little better on it tablet, something with a touch screen. Okay, so at this point, we've gone all the way through all these different sections and panels in the form, and just taking a look at how to fill out different types of data elements. So I want to pause for a second, see if you have any questions at this point. Okay. Let me point out a couple other things real quick here, and then we're going to take a look at validation. One is there's a timeline button that will show all of the times on your reports. Uh, it'll also show things that you did where you didn't put in a time, and, and these ones have been highlighted with validation messages. Uh, but this can be handy if you have some things out of sequence in your report and you're trying to track them down and figure out what happened. 
<clears throat> then this will help with that process. There's also a worksheets button. It'll change, it'll replace all these blue buttons with a green button. And there's one worksheet called feedback. This is a button you can use to put in feedback for the state about the system. Uh, you could use this to um, ask questions uh, or get help if there's something you didn't understand in the system, uh, or to make a suggestion for something that would improve the system and make it easier to use. This feedback gets uh, collected and sent automatically to state EMS staff uh, every Monday morning for the previous week. So that's a handy way to give feedback and keep in touch with the state that way. Okay, so let's look at validation. As we've gone through the report, we saw things that were highlighted in red and had validation issues. Uh, also, down here, there's a big red number, uh, and it has a validation score. The scoring thing is kind of an image trend thing. If you've used the previous image trend system, you're kind of familiar with how they score things. It's somewhat arbitrary. Uh, a report with no errors or warnings on it would have a value of 100 here. And then uh, it just subtracts some amount for each error and warning. Michigan has set things up so that warnings are five points and errors are 10 or 15 points. So you can quickly rack up a big ne negative number here. Uh, the number itself is not so much what you need to pay attention to. It's the actual messages. So let's take a look. I'm going to click on that. And this gives me a list of all the errors and warnings on the report. I can tell the difference between an error and a warning because some of them have this red circle with a slash through it. Those are errors. The others are just warnings. What does that mean? It means that I cannot mark this report finished until I have taken care of this error here. But I can mark the report finished even if it has some of these warnings left on it. So do your best to take care of all of the warnings that you can but for sure, you've got to take care of the errors. So to take care of this error, I could click the button right here with the arrow on it. And it'll take me to that page and to that data element. Here it is, CPR care pri provided prior to EMS arrival. And I can put in an answer uh, to that question. So my validation score has changed. If I click on the list again, that particular error has gone away. I would make my way through the rest of the errors uh, to see if there's anything else. We see there are still a few errors on this report. The rest are all warnings. So resolve as much as you can, but uh, you'll definitely have to resolve the errors. OK, so when we're done and say, OK, I'm finished with this report. I've entered everything. Um, we can close the report. We could also close the report if uh, we're not yet finished, but we just need to save everything we've done and get back into it later. As we've been going through the report, you may have noticed that the Save button has sometimes turned gray, indicating that it is saving as we go. And in fact, it saves updates to the report every time we switch from one page to the next. So it's saving thing, everything as you go along. Uh, you probably never need to actually hit the Save button. But when you close out of a report, that'll make sure that it saves everything you've done as well. And it'll ask you this question, is this incident finished? And this is that key uh, gateway spot that I mentioned earlier. It's important to make sure that every incident gets marked finished at some point. So if you're not done with the report yet, you can close without finishing. Get back to it later and uh, finish it up. If you are done, you can click Finish. And this is what's important about this step. I click Finish, and it checks those required validation errors, the ones with the red circle and the slash. And in this case, it's telling me I, I can't mark the report finished yet because I still have some of those errors on the report. I need to take care of those first. So that's why this is an important step. It allows us to ensure that your report satisfies all error messages, all of those uh, error validation rules. You could still have warnings on the report, and it'll still allow you to mark it finished, but you got to take care of those errors. Okay, so for today, I'm going to just say OK, and I'll close out of the report without finishing it. When I close out of a report, it'll take me to the incident list. 
To get directly to the incident list, I can go to the incidents menu and go view existing EMS. And that would take me to this page that I'm on right now. This will bring up a list of all recent reports that have been entered by this training medic user, uh, including the one that we worked on today. If I want to get back into that report, I can click the arrow button over here, and I'll be in data entry mode again. To get a print view of the report, I can click the print button, and I can choose either a web-based print view or a PDF. And there are different templates I can use for uh, the print view as well. Click OK, and that'll bring up the printable view of this report. We'll give this a second to load. So this is the printable version of the patient care report, and it has all the information that we've filled out on the report. I can close that tab, and I'll be back in the tab that has my incident list. If I need to see changes that have made, been made on this report, I can click the History button. And it will show me that I um, created the report and uh, viewed it. And here I generated a PDF version of it. Uh, after I mark it finished, any further changes that are made to the data of the report, stuff like that is going to show up on this list. I can send a message about this report to someone else through the Image Trend Elite system. Uh, it does not go through email, but it stays within the system. Uh, the advantage of that is that means you can include confidential or private uh, patient information in that message, and that's okay because it's not going out by email. Uh, if you choose to use the messaging features, uh, you'll notice there is an inbox link up here next to your, uh, to your name menu. And if you have messages waiting for you in your inbox, you'll see a red circle with a number in it. Okay, lastly, there's an attachment button. When I was in the patient care report, there was a button to add attachments to it. Um, I can also do it through the incident list. It would show me any existing attachments. There are none on this one. I can add a new attachment, indicate what kind of document that it was, um, and then I can either take a photo or browse my computer for that file and attach that document to this patient care report. Okay, so those are the buttons that I can use to interact with this patient care report. I also want to point out that uh, up here at the top, there's a unit notified date range. It's possible that this date range will be filled in automatically when you come to this page. Uh, sometimes you need to find reports that were more than two weeks ago. So you can click the X next to it. Um, that'll clear it out. And, uh, and then click Go. And that'll give you every report in your agency. Uh, or you can put in a different date range to filter it down. One thing to remember is it's filtering based on the unit notified by dispatch date time. If you start doing a patient care report and then you have to close out of it before you got to the point where you enter your times, then the unit notified by dispatch date time will be blank. And so if there's any date range filter here at all, it will exclude that report from the list. Uh, so you've got to clear out the date range filter if you want to be able to find reports that have a blank uh, unit notified by dispatch date time. I'll see here if I sort by this column. That'll put all the blanks at the top of the list for me. So I see I have a whole bunch here that uh, never got finished. They have a blank unit notified by dispatch date time. All right, so again, to view existing incidents, it's the incidents menu, view existing EMS. OK, so uh, we're just about wrapped up with uh, working with patient care reports. One additional feature that I want to point out here is this elite field login. Uh, Michigan has purchased a feature from ImageTrend called Elite Field. It allows you to fill out patient care reports without an internet connection. If you click on this link, it'll take you to a login page. Uh, you'd put in your same user ID and password that you use for the main site, and it would bring up something called Elite Field. Uh, the advantage here is that uh, everything from the login page on can be utilized without an internet connection. You need to log in first with an internet connection, and then after that, you won't need a connection to log in. 
So you could bookmark this page, and, uh, and then while you're out in the field, maybe with a tablet, uh, even with no internet connection, you can go to that bookmark. It's going to bring up this sign-in page, put in your user ID and password, and it'll allow you to create patient care reports through Elite Field. Uh, the interface will look a little bit different there in Elite Field, but once you click to create a patient care report, it's going to look virtually identical to the layout that we looked at today as we went through a patient care report. Uh, so you can log in, fill out reports, all of that without an internet connection. Then uh, once you have an internet connection again, you can submit those reports to the system. So that can be a useful feature for uh, agencies wanting to do reports out in the field with no connection to the internet. I'll just click back to get back to the main site. If you don't yet have access to Image Trend Elite, you can request your user ID from your agency administrator, someone in your agency. If you are going to be the agency administrator, you can contact Kevin Putman at the state EMS office. Uh, once you have got your user ID, you can try to log in for the first time. If you don't know your password, you can use the Forgot Your Password link. It'll send you an email that will allow you to uh, set your password. The user ID and password that you use for Image Trend Elite are the same user ID and password that you would use for the new Michigan EMS licensing system. So if you have recently gone through relicensure, then uh, you have logged into that system, and you'd use the same user ID and password in Image Trend Elite. Finally, for support, uh, everyone can, of course, turn to someone in their agency who's an administrator in the system uh, as the first level of support, and then to the state of Michigan for the next level of support. Uh, the general email address there is support at myensys.org, or you can directly contact Kevin Putman, who is the Michigan EMS data manager. ImageTrend also provides some support options. Uh, there's the ImageTrend University, which is their knowledge-based site, with a bunch of articles on different topics on how to use the system. Uh, you can get to that uh, by going to the community menu in ImageTrend Elite and then choosing University. ImageTrend also provides a support site. It's also available through the community menu in ImageTrend Elite, uh, or you can use their toll-free number uh, the support site and number would be used for if you're experiencing issues in the system where you need uh, someone at ImageTrend to resolve the issue. Finally, for information about the NEMSYS data standard that we use, you can go to nemsys.org. Uh, I, personally, will be available to support your agency through the transition process as you get everything set up and as you train people in your agency for filling out patient care reports. Uh, and as you go live and after you go live. So feel free to use me over the next several months uh, through June of 2019 to uh, provide support in that transition process. Uh, with that, uh, thanks for attending today, and uh, good luck.